So it's the uh, launch event of Wes's new pamphlet, which he basically came to me um, more or less the weekend after the general election saying, I really want to write some things about um, where I want the left and the Labour Party to go next. And we've been delighted to work with him over the last few months um, to uh, turn this around in, in uh, really quick fire. Uh, but having said that, Wes did write most of the pamphlet uh, before the corona crisis, and I think he'll probably say a few words about that. Uh, it is uh, mainly a before rather than after uh, corona publication. I think that's a distinction we'll probably be making for the rest of our lives. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. I know that lots of you haven't used this um, tech uh, before. So there's a few bits of um, interaction to uh, just get your heads around. Um, on the bottom of your screens, you should see a, um, a function called Q&A, um, which is uh, where we want you to ask um, server submit questions so that um, you can get involved after Wes has said a few words. Um, the way it works is that you type in a question um, that, um, that you, give, you might want to ask and we'll pick a handful of them and we'll unmute you so that when you're the person we've selected to ask a question uh, you'll be able to speak to the whole the whole meeting. Um, you'll also see that we've got um, uh, something to allow you to raise your hands so I don't know if anyone's found that already but uh, you can uh, someone's putting it, let everyone raise their hands just to show your you're listening, um, you're still with us. So we've got 70, 80, very good. Can we get up to 100? Over 100, fantastic. So we've got lots of people uh, not only watching, but hearing what I can say, which is even better. There's also a function called chat. Um, so that is basically for us to chat to you. So um, in particular, we'll send you some links and things like that as the conversation goes on. And to start that off a colleague of mine is going to uh, send to you a link to the pamphlet so you can uh, read it online as we're going um, so that should pop up on your screen in the next uh, minute or so um, it's already there fantastic um, also uh, we're going to send you a couple more links uh, first of all um, a link to join the Fabian Society if you're not already a member. I think most people on the call are already Fabian members, but uh, we would love you to join if you're not. Um, and if you already are, uh, do of course send that link to someone else you know who you think may be uh, a bit um, stuck at home and wanting some intellectual stimulation who could join as well. Um, we'll also in a few minutes um, circulate a link to our donate page. If you would like to donate a bit more to the Fabian Society, um, then we obviously would always be very grateful. Extra donations to the Fabian start at um, £10 a month. Right, so that's enough on the housekeeping. Um, let me just um, sort of say a few words to introduce the pamphlet before I hand over um, to Wes. Um, Wes was uh, inspired by the uh, sort of the 1945 manifesto and sort of the inspiration for the pamphlet and he's really set out um, his arguments over five key chapters um, in the pamphlet which covers the five big challenges he wants to talk about. They are economic inequality, the ageing society, technology revolution, climate emergency, and shifting global power. So if we're going to get through all of that in the course of an hour, it's going to be a busy meeting. Uh, so having uh, set things all up, I think it's uh, definitely time for me to hand over to our speaker this evening, Wes Streeting. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andy, and thank you to all of you for joining us online this evening, especially if you had previously registered to attend our original launch events in Manchester and in London. Um, on that point, I should probably just say a huge thank you actually to the Fabian team, not just for enthous enthusiastically embracing the uh, whole approach to the pamphlet from the moment I had that first conversation with Andy uh, and Liv, but, but also for all of the work that's gone into trying to pull off a launch in really quite extraordinary and unpleasant circumstances. We did actually, I don't mind saying, debate whether or not this event should even go ahead in the circumstances but 
we decided to do it for two reasons. Firstly, um, and I think it's borne out by the numbers of people participating. We had over 400 people register, already 185 people joining us uh, now and, and more watching online. I think given we're asked to stay at home a lot more uh, in these circumstances, I think it's important we're providing more opportunities for people to connect and to be part of a bigger conversation. So whether you're watching alone or um, you're already being driven mad and up the wall by the people you live with, you're very welcome. And I hope that we'll be able to do more uh, things like this afterwards. And, and a plug for Ian Murray's digital pub quiz taking place at 8 p.m. afterwards if the mood takes you in, in lieu of not being able to go to the pub after the event. But actually, the, more seriously, I think the uh, reason for holding the event this evening is, as Andy said, it was written very much in a different context, but many of the issues that I address in Let Us Face the Future Again have a renewed salience and actually have been thrown into sharp relief by the coronavirus um, pandemic. We're in the midst of a crisis that demands a response on a wartime scale. We are effectively a, in a war against uh, an invisible killer. Uh, in these circumstances, party political dividing lines uh, are you know, naturally being thrown to the wayside as we focus on defeating our common enemy. We continue to hold the government to account where we feel they fall short, uh, but also I think it's encouraging that the government has been responding constructively to the suggestions we've been put forward. And I think that's been reflected in the announcements we've had and I suspect the announcements yet to come. Let Us Face the Future, again, was written in a very different uh, circumstance and with a very different context in mind. Our worst defeat since 1935 and the existential threat to our party if the debate about our future becomes locked in a battle between two competing visions of the past. So I, I won't dwell on that in my opening remarks. And as you'll read in the introduction, the pamphlet sets out plainly where I think the Labour Party has gone so badly wrong during the last five years. But the central warning of the pamphlet is also the repository of hope for our party and its place in our national story. That our country is looking more, uh, more for more than a protest against past wrongs and that Labour only wins when it turns its face firmly to the future. As Andy said, I look at five big challenges facing the future of our country over the coming decades. Economic inequality, our aging society, technological revolution, the climate emergency, and shifting global power. I also offer some suggestions about how our party might respond to each of these challenges, building the consent, the support, the trust of the public necessary to make sure that it's a Labour government that's able to uh, steer our country through the coming years. If there's one thing that we know about crises of this magnitude is that they have a tendency to accelerate historical processes and trends. Just this weekend, Yuval Noah Hariri set out brilliantly in this weekend's FT uh, long read, uh, The World After Coronavirus, that we should anticipate many of the uh, decisions government is taking now to have a lasting impact. So given that decisions taken by the government in the coming days and weeks will shape our country for years to come, we have a responsibility to make sure that the choices taken now don't just see our country through the crisis, but build a better economy, society, and world in its aftermath. When future generations look back on our response to this pandemic, they should be able to do so with the same pride that our generation looks back on the legacy of the Attlee government, which rebuilt Britain after the war and helped to build new international institutions that would form the basis of the rules-based international system. If there's one thing we've already seen painfully in the last few weeks, it's that the liberal market settlement born of Thatcherism is not up to the job of rebuilding Britain's economy to work in the interests of everyone. But nor are the often hierarchical and paternalistic institutions of our existing welfare state. Both require reimagination to meet the challenges of the 21st century. We should ask how it was that our country ever thought it was acceptable for people on statutory sick pay to live on less than £100 a week, or people out of work, uh, often because of disability or because they're unable to find a job where their skills match the requirements, you know, to the fact that we expect them to live on even less. How was it that we went into this crisis with older and disabled people dangerously and avoidably exposed to this pandemic 
because of our failure to fix our broken social care system and, and to build an NHS that's capable of weathering winter, let alone a pandemic on this scale. We should decry the fact that at a time when we really needed global leadership, our world leaders were frankly missing in action. And I think all of us are owed global leadership uh, that's a lot better than slogans like America first. So turning to each of these challenges to tackle economic inequality in our society, I argue for a new beverage commission to redesign the welfare state for the 21st century, a universal basic infrastructure serving every part of our country and the biggest devolution of power in British history to hand more power and resources to communities so that people genuinely have power and control over their lives, answering the call of many of those people who voted leave in the in the Brexit referendum. If there's one thing we know about uh, the, the jubilation we saw in Parliament Square on the night that Britain left the European Union, is that many of those people felt that Brexit would deliver real power, control and agency over their own lives. And look, you and I may not believe that Brexit will deliver that, but if the Labour Party doesn't exist to give people like those women and communities that voted leave, uh, more power, control, agency over their lives, then what exactly is the labour movement for? The coronavirus pandemic has confronted many families with the harsh reality of our social insecurity system. So we should commit to restoring a social security system that's worthy of the name, with income protection with people who lose their jobs, support to get people back to work, and where people genuinely can't work because of long-term ill health or disability, we should provide them an income that doesn't just give them uh, the, the resources to exist, but to live a, an enjoyable and rewarding and fulfilling life that any of us would wish to live. As I mentioned, older people have been left dangerously and avoidably exposed to coronavirus because of our failure to address the social care crisis. In my chapter on the ageing society, I argue that we need to change our whole approach to social care. So that we're not talking about old people as if they're a burden or a drain on our resources. And so that older people don't look towards retirement with fear and dread, but as something to actively look forward to. And not just so they can look back on a life well lived, but so they can live life to the full until the very end. That means making braver political choices. We can start with making sure that we have a national settlement of entitlement so that people in whatever part of the country they live in uh, have an understanding and a common experience of what it is that they are entitled to. Uh, we need to make sure that we value our workforce, whether they're um, homegrown talent that we nurture and invest in, or people that we welcome from overseas to look after us when actually we're our most vulnerable and when dignity really matters to us. And we've also got to make the brave political choices. We've got to stop attacking our political opponents uh, when they try and talk about how we fund social care, um, just as we lamented the fact that they savaged Gordon Brown and Andy Burnham when they dared to suggest something uh, remotely resembling what was savaged as a death tax. Look, I, I think ultimately we've got to care more about how we fund the living than how we tax the dead. When we think about the coronavirus and the impact it's had on um, the jobs of the future, on, on the jobs of today, we should think about the impact that the technological revolution is going to have on the jobs of the future. Technology is already changing the way that we um, live our lives, the way we interact, the way we socialise, the way we're having this conversation now. Uh, but the future of work is one that's going to be seriously disrupted by technology. And of course, there are going to be new jobs created, new opportunities in the economy. But there are going to be some people in some communities and certainly uh, from certain social backgrounds who are going to be seriously affected, dislocated and all the rest of it. So we should see the disruption uh, to the labour market caused by coronavirus as a wake up call to make sure that um, for the future we have a, as I said, it's not just a system of social security that keeps people uh, uh, protected, but actually to make sure we're investing in things like lifelong learning so that people can reskill and retrain uh, for the jobs of the future. We've got to make sure that just as our country led the first industrial revolution, that we're pioneering the next. Investing in uh, research and development, I propose increasing GDP spend on uh, R&D to 3%, which is ambitious, but I think is um, wholly uh, necessary. 
uh, and, um, and also looking at how we translate the excellent innovation that takes place in our universities today into, um, into applied research so that we're creating new inventions and new technologies that will change our world for the better, whether that's um, the huge advances and the huge potential to be made in medical science or any of the other applications that we will see from uh, technology. One of the side effects of the response to the coronavirus pandemic has been the huge fall in harmful emissions uh, and particulates across the world as economies have just been shutting down. Uh, now, I, I think we should, if we think things are bad now, I think we should think about the disruptive impact that climate change will have on every aspect of our lives if, unless we get this right. So I call for a Green New Deal that, yes, has a green industrial revolution at its heart, uh, with just transition to help workers move from uh, polluting industries that they work in now to the green jobs of the future. Uh, but we've also got to be a lot more radical and a lot more pioneering, particularly thinking about our expertise in the world on green finance. Uh, I think it's actually commendable that Mark Carney, during his tenure as governor of the Bank of England, has really shown global leadership in the greening of our financial system. Uh, there is so much more um, that we can do on that front. We've got to have uh, a national mission with enforceable targets, a sustainable economy act, a clean air act, uh, and, and a green industrial strategy to truly decarbonize our economy. Um, finally, uh, the final theme is about shifting global power. Clement Attlee famously said that the price of freedom is still eternal vigilance. The world is changing around us. Global power is shifting from west to east. The rules, the institutions, the values that have underpinned international relations since 1945 are under strain. And a backlash against uh, globalization has given birth to extremism and populism. I actually argue that it's a serious uh, to, to think that it's not yet clear whether tyranny or democracy will define the 21st century. And I argue that our foreign policy should be based on promoting democracy, freedom, and human rights with a renewed uh, effort to rebuild international institutions and, un and an unwavering commitment to our defense and security and the international alliances that keep us safe, frankly, addressing some of the concerns that Labour ha people had about Labour at the last uh, general elections. And I also think we need to think really seriously about how we defend liberal democracy here at home too. Uh, let's be honest, we've seen too many examples of populism on the right with attacks on our judiciary, uh, in uh, the media, the BBC, even Parliament for scrutinising the government over Brexit. But we've also seen a populism on the left too, epitomised by the jeering of journalists at our own press conferences. That's got to stop. Our democracy is too fragile, our freedom too precious uh, to risk. And I, and I think that we've got to be as serious about defending our liberal democracy here at home as we've got to be about defending liberal and advancing liberal democracy uh, abroad, including our responsibility to protect those citizens uh, who are currently at risk of barbarism, uh, torture, and other human rights abuses as a response as a result of the despotic regimes that they live under. So, after our worst defeat since 1935, we have a simple mission to renew the Labour Party so that we can rebuild our country. I don't disavow the criticisms that I've made of our leadership. Uh, during the last five years. And I know, frankly, this will still be a point of contention amongst sections of our membership who take a very different view. Uh, but as I argue in the pamphlet, um, we don't have to uh, you know, jettison every policy, uh, ape the Tories or embrace the economics of austerity to be a winning party again. And if I have one frustration, it's that there are lots of members who think that when I've criticized our leadership and people like me have criticized our leadership during the last five years, it's because we just want to cut our public services. And when we're not doing that, we're looking at a map of the world and deciding which Middle Eastern country we want to bomb next. I think we really do a disservice to each other when we stop listening to each other and when we talk across each other. And in that spirit, um, I've put forward a set of ideas because I think in new leadership, there is an opportunity for us to come together to rediscover what it is we have in common, but also to turn our collective efforts and our faces firmly to the future. Uh, I don't pretend to have all of the answers in this pamphlet. I don't believe that any one individual or political tradition has a monopoly on wisdom or virtue. But as I say in the foreword to this pamphlet, this is, um, firmly and unapologetically rooted 
in the mainstream centre-left traditions that have seen Labour win a majority on five occasions during our 130-year history. Uh, and uh, it's a, it's a modernising tradition that understands that if Labour wants to win, we have to apply our traditional values to the challenges of the future. Um, in that spirit, I look forward to debate and discussion this evening and hopefully with members across the country in the coming weeks and months. Uh, but most of all, um, I'm looking forward to the discussion that's about to take place now. So thank you very much for joining in. I hope you enjoyed reading the pamphlet and I, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion this evening and we have many more like it. Brilliant. And um, Wes, thank you so much for that. Um, let me start off the questions before I pull in some of um, the uh, delegates we have registered with us. Um, if you'd written this pamphlet two or three months later in the midst of the coronavirus, what do you think you might have said a little bit differently than when you were writing in January and February? Well, firstly, um, I think partly this is about pace uh, and scale. I talk about, um, you know, take the technological revolution, for example. Um, look, I think this is going to affect our country differently to previous industrial revolutions because the pace and scale is going to be so different. And for example, I, I, I say very clearly in the, in the pamphlet that um, when you think about the um, challenges of the displacement of workers and the future of jobs, uh, down the track, um, if we have mass unemployment caused by technology, uh, we may need to look at things like a universal basic income. Now, um, I just the other week signed a letter calling for a form of universal basic income now to protect us through the pandemic. I don't actually think that will be a medium term answer for our country in terms of where we need to be, but I think it's, it's a really good example of how some of the longer term trends and issues that I talk about in the pamphlet have just been fast forwarded by what we are living through and going through. Um, what, what I would caution though, and maybe the cautionary tale I think I would have amplified if anything in this pamphlet is this. In the aftermath of the financial crash, I think there was a complacency on sections of the left, particularly after the first term of coalition government, where people said, well, look, um, things are bad. People have seen the banks have been reckless. They've seen that selfish greed have brought um, the, the global economy to the brink of collapse. Capitalism has failed. And on top of that, we've had a Tory government that's pursued austerity. People will now be looking to Labour. Labour doesn't win elections by default. And all I would caution right now as people are looking to these extraordinary policies being implemented by a Conservative government is don't imagine that because the Conservatives have, what have rediscovered the importance of the state and state action, that voters will naturally by default look to Labour uh, to provide an alternative. We've got to make sure that we've got a positive answer at the next election that speaks to the challenges of the future, but also recognises that enduring truth in any circumstances, whatever the election, which is generally speaking, voters believe that Labour has its heart in the right place. At elections, we have to persuade them we've got our head in the right place too, and that we can be trusted with the money, that we can be trusted with the tough decisions, that we can be tough, trusted with, uh, with their security too. And I suspect um, that that will be the case at the next election too. So, um, you know, just, just as, a, as a party, as a movement, don't imagine that any election will fall into our lap. Um, this is still existential for the Labour Party. And I think we're right to work constructively with the government, to, construct, to, to challenge constructively, but we're not going to win the next election or indeed any election by default. Thanks, Wes. Um, another question from me. Um, when I was reading the pamphlet, I thought that your fifth chapter on global relations meant you stood very firmly in a different tradition from Jeremy Corbyn, the outgoing leader. But when I read the other four, I thought there was an awful lot that Jeremy or John McDonnell could have agreed with in, in what you said. Um, so my question is, what, to what extent do you think you are broadly endorsing the views that were put forward in the 2019 manifesto and to what extent would you say that on domestic policy you think we we need to go in a very different direction from what was presented in 2019 
Yeah, and, and I think that's a, that's a great question. And we've got to be really clear about what the dividing lines in our party have been. Because as I've said, you know, as far as I'm concerned, things like tackling poverty, tackling hunger, tackling homelessness, um, tackling the um, grave injustices that blight our society, those are not um, Corbyn values, those are Labour values. Those are the things that motivated me to join the Labour Party as a 15 year old um, back in 1998. They were central missions of the last Labour government that literally lifted millions of people out of poverty and pretty much ended rough sleeping on our streets. So um, those are, you know, the, people like me haven't been criticising the, the current leadership because we, we're, we're in favour of economic injustice, quite the opposite. Um, similarly, you know, on human rights, you know, uh, we, would, we would, you know, I don't think there will be much between us when we talk about the importance of defending human rights. Where I think the Labour Party went badly wrong and where I criticise Corbynism in the pamphlet is that we offered a manifesto that people didn't feel they could believe in, where even if they supported individual policies as a whole, they thought it was, a, as a, was an unbelievable prospectus. And look, when you are releasing a fully costed manifesto, but then days later adding, adding another 80 billion on for the WASPy women, um, which even they saw as too good to be true, you know, I'm afraid that, that those kind of fantasy Corbynomics just people didn't believe in. Secondly, um, there was a worldview that people reviled. And, and look, I, I found it really morally quite challenging, uh, the response to the, the poisoning of the Scream House in Salisbury, where our leadership basically parroted the Kremlin line and said, send the samples to Russia. Uh, you know, I'm afraid there was just a back catalogue of statements, both in relation to Russia, but also in terms of um, tackling domestic terrorism that just meant that people didn't trust us to keep our country safe. And if they don't trust you with that basic f f primary mission of government, the safety and security of the people, you don't get the permission to do anything else. And finally, that the culture of our party, um, you know, I do think that there is a, uh, a, 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 a kind of conspiracy theorist policy. So I would talk about, as I do in my pamphlet, broken capitalism and the need to repair it, the need to work with the best of British business to reform the worst of British capitalism. I'm just as outraged as crony capitalism and the behavior of companies like Carillion as everyone else. But what I don't think is that there is some kind of rigged system of a few people pulling strings at the center of the world, which I'm afraid has given rise to uh, an anti-Semitic conspiracy politics that saw people bullied out of our country. So it's the culture of the party that I want to change too. Um, but look, there, there's a whole load of stuff in the pamphlet that I hope that people right across the party, whether they voted twice for Jeremy Corbyn or never voted for Jeremy Corbyn would agree with. And I hope that we can try and unite around that. And, and I hope that as we debate the future and negotiate the future and trying to bring our country together, that we can try and do that respectfully. And that I recognize my responsibility in this as much as anyone else. You know, in some of the language that we've used uh, in the last five years, like, you know, talking about new members as three pound trots and stuff like that. Look, may, mea culpa, um, I'm sorry, some of those, you know, that language has been wrong. We've, we've got a responsibility to try and repair the culture of our party. Uh, and, and all of us have got responsibility in that, and I will accept my fair share of that too. What I'd say is actually when you read those four central domestic chapters, an awful lot of people who may have criticised you in the past, Wes, might be surprised how much they agree with what you've written. Now I'm going to turn to um, some of our um, questioners online. The first person I'm going to ask to come in and speak is um, is Estelle, I can't see her first name, this her name, Estelle Hart. Um, Estelle, you're able to speak now if you want to ask your question to Wes. Oh, hi Wes. Um, Wes, you've talked about uh, coronavirus and sort of a lot of the, pro the problems within the country that it's exposed as well as that it's caused, but how do we ensure that post this we don't just return to business as usual? I think um, particularly in terms of work and flexibility with it, the amount of businesses, institutions that have moved to more flexible online working and working from home. Um, how do we ensure that that, which is also a more accessible way of work for people with care and responsibilities and people with disabilities, how do we make sure that some of, I don't want to say the positives necessarily, but um, they're mainstreamed? 
Yeah, that's great. That's a great point, Estelle. I mean, um, I, I hope that by with some of the arguments that we're making about things like statutory sick pay and universal credit, there are lots of families who've never considered being on SSP or universal credit before, who have looked on the government's website in the last week and have been horrified by the levels of, of, of money that we expect people to live on. So I hope that will lead to a cultural change um, amongst the public and real public policy change that is lasting. I think some of this will happen culturally. I think we can work from home uh, more easily. We can do more remote working. I hope employers will get on, on board with that. But you've given the opportunity just to talk briefly about one of the central um, policy recommendations of the pamphlet, which is to establish a good work commission. Um, modelled on the low pay commission, the good work commission would bring together employers, trade unions, other experts, civil society, to negotiate the future of employment rights, because we're already seeing the extent to which the gig economy and companies like Uber are eroding the hard-won uh, employment rights and protections that we've, that we've won over the course of a century. And technology should be a force for progress, yet we're seeing too much of that progress uh, undone. A good work commission would enable the right people uh, with the right instincts uh, and frankly the competing interests that sometimes have to be um, navigated and negotiated to get around the table and negotiate our future. Look at what the difference that having the TUC around the table last week with the government made to Rishi Sunak's announcements on employment protections and the levels of income protection that a Conservative government is, is offering. Look at how um, the minimum wage, which was a policy that had been fought for over the course of a century and delivered by a Labour government, not only was introduced by a Labour government, but became embedded and increased by a Conservative government because we established the architecture there to make it lasting. A good work commission would enable us to navigate the new landscape of technology and the way in which it impacts on the labour market, but also take into account um, a whole load of factors that frankly should have been dealt with for such a long time now. You know, the exclusion of so many women, for example, from the workforce, the fact that there are lots of disabled people who could contribute. Um, if only we change our employment practices just a bit. I hope a good work commission would be able to change the culture and the practice of work in our country. And there's no need to wait. I really hope that, the, I was about to say Keir Starmer, but we'll wait and see who is elected leader. I hope the new leadership establishes a shadow good work commission in opposition, so that within the first 100 days of a new Labour government, we can put in place a landmark employment rights bill uh, that changes the future of work for good. Great, thanks Wes. I'm going to bring in Arnab Dutt. Arnab, you're able to talk now. Are you still there, Arnab? We got quiet. Right, so Arnab's question was, um, Wes, do you believe the new normal of massive state intervention by the Tories gives your pamphlet greater credence? Well, one of the things that I argue for in the pamphlet is that um, we, should, we should run proposed nationalisation and public ownership um, through a series of tests, which is, you know, does it create better value uh, for the taxpayer? Does it lead to a better service? And does um, it give people more power and control and level up the country uh, in, in the process? Uh, because I think the East Coast mainline, for example, showed that um, models of public ownership can deliver a better service and better value. But the public need to be reassured that Labour's arguing for common ownership, not because we're ideologues, but because we want to make things better and we've got some serious proposals uh, to do that. Um, I would, you know, just caution a little on this that, uh, you know, we are currently living through wartime, really, conditions in terms of the pace at which the government is making big decisions to intervene in industry. Uh, that, that is not necessarily going to survive the peace. So if we want to make the case for public ownership, and I think there are a number of examples where there are pragmatic ar arguments to be made for public ownership, we've, we've just got to always remind ourselves that this is an argument that has to be won, that people need to be persuasive, persuaded, and you can't just drop um, new proposed nationalisations into a manifesto at the, 11th, at the 11th hour, or indeed after the 11th hour. And do you know, during the general election campaign, there were shadow treasury ministers who were briefing business leaders, industry leaders, that the extent of our nationalisation ambitions had been settled, and only days later we announced the nationalisation of BT Openreach. I can tell you, after that policy, I had never known that I had so many BT Openreach workers living in Ilford North. So, you know, 
public ownership, I'm not ideologically opposed to it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pragmatically in favor of it. Uh, where it is genuinely going to make a, 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 a difference in terms of the experience. But where, where that's an argument to be won, you do have to accept that we have to make the argument. Uh, great. Thanks, Wes. I'm going to bring in uh, Nashuba Khan. Uh, Nashuba, are you there? Do you want to ask your question? Uh, she's on mute. I think I've... Hi, Wes. You're... Go ahead. Great. Um, hi, Wes. Thanks for um, that insight. It's been really great um, to hear what you've got to say. My question is around the fact that we're due to have a new leader um, on the 4th of April. Please, um, what would you like to see in terms of leadership from them on day one? What actions would you like to see coming out of our new leadership in order to make some of this a reality and the fact that they're going to be leading a party in extraordinary circumstances? Yeah, thanks, Nosha. I thought the, um, the next leader had a difficult job as it was to lead us back from our worst defeat since 1935. Coming in the middle of a crisis like this, um, you know, I, I really wouldn't wish it on, on anyone, frankly. Um, I, I think the first thing we've got to do, and the new leader's got to do, is make it clear that um, they will work alongside the government to, um, to, to fight the coronavirus pandemic and work constructively in the way that we've already seen people like John Ashworth doing very clearly, but also being willing to challenge the government robustly. Uh, I think we've got to, um, in terms of look, looking to the future, um, I think we've got to gra grapple with the fact that we lost as badly as we did and that the Labour Party needs fundamental change. It needs change within its culture, within the institutions of the Labour Party uh, and, and with the, within the policy outlook as well. The challenges of the next election are going to look very different to the challenges of the last election. So, um, you know, the leader should resist the siren calls that are saying you must be wedded to this policy, you must be wedded to this plank of the last losing manifesto. Uh, you know, you've got to keep X person or, or, or Y position. Uh, I think we've got to set them free to lead and to lead facing the future. And um, we've got responsibility to get behind them and help them to make them a success. And, you know, recognize that this is a team effort. And, you know, there's a lot riding on the shoulders of the next leadership team, but we're all part of the leadership team, right? Um, you know, MPs are part of that leadership team, but I would argue that every Labour member's part of this leadership team. I'm someone that's believed for a long time in more party democracy. And if members want more say over the direction of our party, I'm really in favour of that, but as I always say to my CLP locally, if you want more say over the decisions, your responsibility to listen to the voters is as great as mine or the leader of the Labour Party, because unless we listen to the voters, uh, listen to their concerns and, and genuinely listen and address them, uh, they don't give you the permission to do anything that you want to do. Wes, I've got a related question from Peter Mandelson. Um, Peter asks, uh, the first iteration of Let Us Face the Future in 1945 uh, came out after 10 years of intensive right. policy innovation and modernization. How can we make sure this precedent is reduced by half in terms of number of years so that we do it in five years? Um, yeah, good question. And I should probably give a, of course it would be, <laughs> um, but I just want to give a shout out to, to um, Peter's grandfather, Herbert Morrison, who uh, wrote the 1945 manifesto, Let Us Face the Future, with Michael Young. So um, I hope, it's, um, I hope it's, uh, it's, if it's done justice to the original Peter, and I've no doubt that you will tell me if it hasn't. Um, um, I really do think this is an urgent task. Already there are people that are talking about the 10 year march back to power and that we need a 1997 scale swing to win the next general election. Well, um, as I am the optimist, given that we did it in 1997, why is the ceiling of our ambition lower than it was then? Why don't we imagine that we can win seats back uh, that we won in 1997 and that we just lost for the first time in our history at 2019? It does require us, and this is where I don't pull my punches in the pamphlet, and I know that this is where some of the debate will be and some of the resistance will come from. I do not pull my punches about 
the scale of the challenge and what has gone wrong and what about our party needs to change. And, and by the way, this isn't just a criticism of the last five years. In fact, if, you know, as I say in the pamphlet, if you want to, let's look back over the history of the Labour Party. Our party has cont contested 31 general elections since it was founded. We've won a working majority in only five of them. That suggests a fundamental problem with the DNA of our party and about our willingness to win. And the reason the Labour Party was founded out of the Labour movement is because our founders understood that it wasn't enough to march through the streets demanding change. You have to march through the corridors of power to deliver it. And for too many occasions throughout our history, we've repeated the same cycle, um, you know, sort of carping and, and, and complaining and, you know, trying to suggest that we should be sort of self-righteous and, and, and ideologues about the change that we want to see. Uh, if, we don't, if we don't scale up to the, the challenge that we face and face up to the, the, the scale of that challenge, uh, then we will not win the next general election. But I think if we, um, if we work hard, if we confront the scale of the challenge, and if we pull together to debate the ideas that we need to win and do it quickly, uh, then we can win the next general election. But it is going to require fundamental change to the culture of our party, our policy outlook, and to the people and institutions within the Labour Party that led us to a catastrophic defeat. Great. Um, I've now got a question from Emma Whistle. Is she, Emma? Not working. So, hi, Andrew. Hi, Wes. Um, Wes, you talk about winning back seats, but you know I've got a personal interest in winning seats we've never won before. And there are a number of them that we've never won before that we've got to win at the next election. How do you think we're going to do that? Um, Emma, that's a great question. And um, I'm really sorry, by the way, that the Labour Party let candidates like you down, who's absolutely slogged your guts out in a seat like Chicken Barnet, that in normal circumstances we could have won. And we know that the um, problems we had internally within our party in terms of anti-Semitism and our failure to address it had electoral consequences. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, this is a moral issue. We should be sorting out because we should be better than that, but it had uh, ramifications electorally too. Um, I think we've got to look at the map of our country afresh. Um, it's not just about how the coalition of Labour's voters is changing and how we rebuild that coalition. It's also about how constituencies have changed and how the demographics of different constituencies have changed. So I think we've got to look with a fresh pair of eyes at the electoral map of the country, look at the coalition of voters that we need to build in order to win a majority of seats that we need to govern. Um, so I hope that seats like Chipping Barnet um, are high up there on our target list, but um, I think there will be some other lists of seats um, on, on, you know, lists of seats on that, which will be surprising. High Wycombe, for example, uh, a conservative seat held by Steve ba Baker, an architect of Brexit, who I served with on the Treasury Committee. High Wycombe is now a winnable Labour seat. So I think there are going to be some surprises. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, but I think we've got to look at the map of the country afresh. Great. I want to take a question from Mariana Masters. I don't know if she's still on the line. Mariana, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. I want to ask your question? Yes. Hi. Um, thanks, Wes. Um, you mentioned uh, the change of culture of, um, at the party and I'm very, you know, committed to grassroots politics um, and uh, the last few years I think we could, a lot of us can agree that meetings at branch level and at CLP level have been really um, challenging. What three practical uh, recommendations can you make so that uh, the party can un understand that we are a broad church and that everyone should contribute to some of the great ideas that you've put forward? Yeah, so you mentioned it's a broad church, and as we're as we're in Lent, I, I might commend actually Christians on the left and their and their ten um, their ten commitments for CLPs to make to create kinder meetings. One of the things I'm proud of um, about the culture in my own constituency party is that we have been very ecumenical, and whether it's my um, CLP executive committee or the all member meetings that we have you really do see the breadth of the Labour Party represented around the table and we are able to debate issues and ideas in a genuinely comradely welcoming and inclusive way 
And I think we've got a responsibility to lead by example. I'm really hoping to set up some discussion events um, off the back of the ideas that I'm setting forward, but also with people from right across the breadth of the party, from people, you know, with people from different Labour traditions, because I think we are going to have to navigate and negotiate the future together. And look, it's been a, the division has been a source of weakness for our party in the last five years, but historically, the, the way in which the Labour Party brings together the broad left of our country, uh, which otherwise would probably be in different political parties if we were um, on the continent and had a different electoral system, can actually be a real strength um, if we listen to each other, reflect on each other's points of view, and really sort of draw together um, our analysis and, and most importantly our answers. Um, I think throughout Labour's history, we win when our liberal and communitarian traditions, for example, reconcile not just the divisions that exist within our party, but actually the, the, the differences that we speak for in the country. Um, so let's do more of that. Let's, let's really work hard at being more ecumenical. Let's try and, and share platforms with people that we don't always agree with. That's one of the reasons, by the way, why I chose to um, launch this pamphlet with the Fabians and why I, I hope that many of you will join if you haven't already. It's because the, the Fabian Society historically has been very good at bringing together different traditions within our party. At the Fabian Conference, for example, I, I was on a panel with Paul Mason, and I'm not sure who was more horrified by the end of the panel that we agreed so much, me or Paul. Um, but it does show that actually, um, you know, it can sound trite and cliche, but we, we do have more in common than sometimes uh, we, would, we, would, um, we would allow people to believe. And I think we should rediscover that tradition more in our party. Great. Um, I've got a policy focused question on one of the areas you write about, which is evolution. Um, I've got Brian Keegan. Are you on the line still, Brian? Yes, I am. Yes. Uh, uh, could you be a bit more specific about how you propose to devolve power to the regions and what sort of new structures of local government, etc. are you suggesting? Because we are the most over centralized country in the developed world. And I know Brian yeah. is calling from Peterborough, Wes. Yeah, well, thank you, Brian. And um, I am a, a vice president of the Local Government Association and a former councillor. So I am very um, passionate about this. And by the way, it's no, as I argue in the pamphlet, it is no coincidence that we have one of the most centralised systems of government in the Western world and also one of the most unequal uh, societies. And you are not telling me that people who are sat here in Westminster or across Whitehall are better uh, placed to make decisions about individual communities than those communities themselves. Um, I've steered clear of running straight to a structural prescription. In fact, what I've um, suggested is that we work with the local government association and with our leaders in local government and councillors across the country to look at what the right structures would be. So I think there are questions already about the way that um, the, the serendipitous and slightly haphazard um, uh, system of devolution has, has grown up across England where we've got metro mayors for some regions and not others we've got counties and unitary authorities and all the rest of it so I think as far as we can try and rationalize some of that so that everyone understands the system of English governance that would be a good start but I would really like to see the real devolution not just of power and as we've seen under the Tories blame but also resources to uh, to, to local authorities across the country to give them more scope over things like um, employment and jobs, uh, education and skills, um, health, um, culture. I think there are a whole range of areas where we, where we give more power away. But um, I, I, I kind of ducked out of being prescriptive about that for two reasons. One, I wanted to practice what I preach and it seemed wrong for me to try and dictate this in the pamphlet. And secondly, it, it seemed a bit easier when I was writing so expansively about a whole wide range of issues to farm some of the thorny, difficult issues out to some other people to get involved as well. Wes, I've got a question from uh, Delbert uh, Sandiford, uh, which is, you're saying very little that is new in this pamphlet. Uh, lifelong learning, more public spending on R&D, universal basic income, a Green New Deal. Um, I'm losing the text. You get the impression. Um, basically, what's new in this pamphlet that hasn't been said before by many others on the left? Well, well some of it does unapologetically draw on uh, a whole range of ideas that have been um, bubbling away out there in, in, in the world of think tanks and right across the Labour Party. And, and you know, I'm, I'm not kind of claiming uh, divine wisdom here. 
I think there are some things that are genuinely new, like the Good Work Commission that I uh, mentioned. Uh, also, when it comes to um, make how we make decisions about how we spend, for example, I, I argue very strongly that we need a progressive income, a, a progressive impact test in terms of our public spending commitments. Because I think when you look at particularly the 2017 manifesto, but it's also applied to the 2019 manifesto, uh, one of the things that um, Rachel Reeves and I argued for on the Treasury Committee was, a, was a, an impact assessment of how government budgets and spending decisions impact on households with different levels of income. And if you'd run that alongside the 2017 and 2019 manifestos, I think you would be very surprised at how much we were giving away to uh, the wealthier households and how little we were giving to lower income households. For example, um, I feel very strongly about the fact, particularly as someone who grew up on benefits, that our manifesto needed to be more generous in terms of redressing the imbalances in social security, yet our 2019 manifesto was less generous on welfare for people on, you know, in poverty and hardship than the Liberal Democrats manifesto. I don't think we should be going into, a, into a, an election being less progressive than the Liberal Democrats. Um, there are a whole range of other ideas that run right through the pamphlet. I mean, for example, you mentioned lifelong learning. That is true. But, you know, why on earth were we proposing to spend double the amount of universities than we were proposing to spend um, on, on schools and early years, which we know makes a really enormous impact in terms of people's life chances. And, and I think 10 times what we're proposing to spend on lifelong learning. If we're serious about lifelong learning and improving people's life chances, we've got to get our priorities right. You know, it's the old Nye Bevan saying, the language of priorities is the religion of socialism. We've got to rediscover some of that. There were far too many middle class giveaways and not enough that was genuinely about improving people's life chances and opportunities um, but, uh, but you know in some areas you know I, I, I kind of um, absolutely lean into the things that I think have gone right in the last uh, five years like the green industrial revolution and I, I don't think there is any shame in that whatsoever I think that's positive. I'm going to bring in uh, Liz Hind now who is writing for the Fabian Society website this week on self-employment. Liz are you there? I am here, yes, and my article actually went out on over Twitter two hours ago, so once you're done with this call, you can maybe read that article. Um, the question I wanted to ask is whether or not we see self-employment becoming a trend, particularly if we bring in policies like basic incomes where flexible employment and self-employment becomes a lot more possible for more people and you talked about the industrial revolution, that saw a big change in our workforce. How do we make sure that the self-employed aren't left behind when a lot of the policies that we're looking at are about employment rights, which 5 million self-employment void workers won't benefit from? Yeah, I think that's a, a great question, Liz. And, and look, we can see with public policy in the last week, that having a strong voice for the self-employed is going to be absolutely critical. Um, in terms of how far um, this is going to become the trend, this is really contested territory and one of the issues that I kind of um, you know, nod to in the pamphlet, to, to what extent are we going to see more people in self-employment or in precarious uh, employment as a, as a result of technology? Um, the question of the extent or how quickly this happens, I think, um, will become less important and secondary if we get the public policy framework right. And I would hope that the Good Work Commission that I mentioned would help to produce some of the policies that um, help promote and support genuine self-employment uh, and make sure that we've got the right um, rights and protections in place for the self-employed, particularly when we have a shock um, of the type we've just had. But also, um, one of the other proposals in the, in the document is for a joint commission with the TUC on 21st century trade unionism because I think you know we still have a problem with our trade unions in this country which is um, although you can point some really great examples like the GMB taking Uber to court or the work the community has been doing uh, on on the future of work and, and some of the stuff they've been putting out just today actually about self-employment um, we don't we don't have um, a strong uh, unionized voice outside of the public sector generally but I think we need a much stronger union voice in terms of the changing world of work and I think we've got to work with the unions to develop 21st century trade unionism so that um, people do find a voice 
and different forms of protection in a union as well, you know, like um, insurance for self-employed people so that if they do fall sick um, or are out of work for a while or work dries up, that there is, a for, there is a safety net there for them. And whether that's provided by trade unions or provided by the state through the tax system and public policy, I think these are some of the big issues we need to debate. Uh, but, but frankly, um, you know, what we saw from the Chancellor just last week in terms of income, income protection and the omission of 5 million self-employed people in this country tells you that self-employed people, I don't need to tell you Liz, but, you know, tells us generally that we need a much stronger voice when it comes to self-employment and for the self-employed in this country. Great, thank you. Um, Desmond Felix, are you still on the line? Would you like to ask your question? Hi Desmond, are you there? Hello, I'm here. Great, do you want to ask your question? Hi Wes, uh, my question was, how do you plan to practically represent black and minority ethnic people in the potential new Labour? Because black voters are often paid lip service despite their historical voter loyalty to Labour, as the Windrush scandal and continual low educational attainment will attest to. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with what you've just said there, um, Desmond, I'm really alive to it. I represent one of the most um, ethnically and religiously diverse constituencies um, in Britain and representation matters. Um, you know, that's why just today working with Naz Shah, we've managed to amend the coronavirus bill so that um, burial rights for uh, Muslim and Jewish communities are taken into account um, in, you know, as the current crisis uh, unfolds. But whether it's um, educational disadvantage, di disadvantage that carries through into the workplace, um, there is no doubt that we still have ingrained structural racism and inequality in our society uh, that needs to be addressed. Um, I, I think that one of the things we need to do is to make sure that our approach to the equalities agenda is better embedded across every team uh, and every part of our policy making, uh, uh, you know, within our shadow teams. Um, I, I, I don't like, and I say this as, um, you know, a member of the LGBT community, I don't like the way that sometimes these things are siloed off as if it's only the job of the shadow women in equalities minister to raise these issues on our behalf or frankly that it's only the job of gay MPs to talk about gay issues or BME MPs to talk about um, tackling racism. Um, so uh, I think we've got to make sure that just as we're looking at the progressive impact assessment uh, across our policies we're looking at the equalities impact uh, assessment too uh, and, and I've, I, you know, I, I think we've definitely got to in terms of our, you mentioned the Windrush scandal, one of the things that we've definitely got to turn a corner on as a, as a country, and I talk about this particularly in the context of the ageing society chapter, uh, this idea that you just sort of pull up the drawbridge and stop people coming to this country as if, as if, as if inward migration is the source of our country's problems. People, I'm afraid we've got to get real about this and we've got to confront this uh, social attitude in our national interest. Because, uh, you know, we, unless we welcome diverse talent to our country, whether that's to work in the creative industries or the City of London, but also in, in, in industries like and sectors like social care, the, the, the reality is with our growing ageing population and our shrinking working age population, we are not going to be able to fulfil the, the, the needs of our country and build the tax base we're going to need to fund our public services. So there's, there's an economic case as well as a moral case here, and I think we've got to be making both. Great. I've got a question now from Liam Martin Lane. Liam, can you hear me? Are you on the line? Liam, are you on the line? No, that's not working. Right, I'm going to have to read his question out. So, hi Wes, you've rightly, uh, you rightly spoke about how Labour needs to win the trust of people and show our head is in the right place. How effective do you think Labour councils can be between now and the next election in trying to do this? So, um, the, the first thing I'll say, if, if, if I'm just being blunt actually, is the fact that we've got local elections deferred for a year, I think is a massive help. I was, I was absolutely terrified actually about these May elections and the lots of really great Labour councils and Labour councillors would pay a heavy price because of the 
um, the overhanging effect of um, our current leadership and what happened at the general election. And I always think it is desperately unfair when we talk about local elections as if they are just milestones in between, you know, now and the next set of national elections. The fact is, in communities like mine, uh, Labour councils aren't just flying the flag for Labour or protecting people from the worst excesses of a Tory government. They are making a positive difference to people's lives. And I think we've got to reflect that in, in the way that we have policy making in our party. I think we've got to shout a lot louder and a lot more proudly about the achievements of Labour in local government and the difference that Labour councils are making. I think we've got to expose more aggressively here in Westminster the fact that most of the difficult choices that councils are having to make are caused here. The problems are made here in Westminster and we've got to, we've got to expose that and highlight that. But we've also got to give our councillors a much stronger say in policy making in our party. Uh, if, and you know, as I argue in the pamphlet, we should be giving way more power to councillors and councils and actually to people themselves in terms of their ability to shape the, the, the public services that they, that they use. Um, but if we're going to give more power away, I think we've got to give more agency as well. Why aren't there more councillors on our National Executive Committee? Why don't we have, when big decisions are being made about policy, senior councillors sat around the table making those decisions with us? Um, this, this has got to be a shared endeavour. So, um, so I, I hope that moving forward, we will have a genuine partnership with labouring local government, where frankly, the leader of Redbridge Council has a lot more power to impact on the lives of my residents than they do as a, as a Labour MP. I want to give him more power. I want to make sure that our neighbouring boroughs and other communities have Labour councils. And I want to make sure that we give them even more power and resources to make the, the difference that our country needs. Wes, that's great. Wes, we've used up our hour. I'm going to ask one more questioner to come in and then if you'd like to both answer that question and also uh, wrap up the whole conversation. The last person I'm going to ask to come in is Sean. Are you there, Sean, still? Yep. Hi. Um, my question is, um, you earlier mentioned that we should create a modern day beverage system. Do you have any ideas to who you think should lead the beverage commission for the 21st century? Do you think there are any specific politicians who you think could lead with a strong directive to bring forward a more fair and just democratic socialist solution to a new and reformed welfare state? Thank you, Sean. So Wes, you want a new beverage commission, but who should be the new beverage? Um, that's, a, that's a really good um, question. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of reticent to, to, to volunteer because <laughs> I think it's a big task. Maybe we need um, a whole group of us that are working together on this and, and people outside Parliament and um, politics as well. But um, I, I guess um, what I would say in conclusion is the Beveridge wrote when he was well, said when he when he published his seminal report which led to the creation of the welfare state that we um that we now have that a revolutionary moment in the world's history is a time for revolutions not for patching and i think that's where we are at this moment in our world's history and i think the the scale of ambition for our next leader should be to um, write a new story for our country and the place of our party within it um, we should be optimistic about our country. People that are, uh, children that are born in Britain today are amongst the luckiest children on the planet. When you look at their life chances, their opportunities, uh, the kind of life that Britain offers. Uh, we're the home of the world-class universities, the captain of industry, the birthplace of Shakespeare and the Beatles. We've got so much to offer the world. We need to make sure that those opportunities are genuinely available to everyone in our country, whatever their background and whichever circumstances they're born into in this country. Uh, so my kind of appeal really to the party with this pamphlet is to um, face the future again. Um, this is a country with intolerable levels of inequality and injustice. So let's create a future where prosperity is created, but also shared equitably and everyone's got a stake in our national success. Let's, let's face a future where um, older people live long into retirement, 
with fulfilling lives right until the very end. Let's make sure that our country pioneers the next industrial revolution just as we did the first and that technology is something that genuinely shapes our lives for the better rather than becomes a, a source of anxiety or moral panic. Um, let's make sure that the future is one where we have um, air that we can breathe and uh, a world that sustains life. And let's take the bold decisions now to avoid the uh, climate emergency becoming a climate uh, catastrophe. And, and I guess the last point, which is about the, the shifting global power and, and, the, and the future of our world. This is a country that maybe outside of the European Union, but we've got bonds of friendships that stretch right across the continent. And whilst the current incumbent of the Oval Office uh, might make international relations and our security uh, you know, more shaky and less secure than, than it was, rather than enhancing our security and protection, our friendship with the United States goes much deeper than the United States and has been the cornerstone of, uh, of the presidency and goes to, to being a cornerstone of our defense and security and has been uh, for, for almost a, a century. So I think working with the liberal democracies of, of the world, let's make sure that this is a century where democracy rather than tyranny uh, prevails. Let's rebuild our international institutions to, to genuinely promote, defend and extend democracy, freedom and human rights. Let's make sure that the future is one that every citizen in every part of the world can look forward to and have a share and stake in the success. And there are so many uh, ideas in, in the pamphlet that we've not had time to discuss with the short time we've had uh, this evening. So I do hope you'll um, have a good read. Let me know what you think. Feel free to feedback. Feel free to invite me to, to speak at your CLP, either virtually or hopefully at some point when this is over. Uh, and, and most importantly, let's keep the conversation going. Let's see ourselves through um, these really difficult times but let's make sure that on the other side, we are creating together a country that is stronger, safer, more prosperous. And in the meantime, stay well, keep safe, and make sure you're social distancing. A public health message to end up. Um, Wes, thank you so much. Um, if you're already a Fabian member, you'll be getting a hard copy of the pamphlet in the post in the next mailing, probably about three weeks time. And uh, if you are not a Fabian member, then there's another reason to join so that you can get your own hands on the pamphlet. It is well worth a read. I mean, we've really only scratched the surface um, in our hour together. Um, if you want to hear more directly from Wes, we put the link up to his newsletter. Um, and you can also, of course, sign up to the Fabian newsletter if you're not a member. If you are a member, as I said at the start, um, please do consider donating a little bit extra to the Fabian Society. This is the first of, I think, lots of online meetings to come. we have uh, in the midst of lining up a series of speakers. So we'll keep telling you in the email about what we've got coming up and do feedback to us how today has been and ideas you'd like for future Fabian online meetings. Thank you very much tonight and have a great evening. Thank you.